We're doing a very special panel with four experts in the mining field, all veterans in the exploration front. Joining me today is Joe Mazumdar, editor of Exploration Insights, Brent Cook, founder of Exploration Insights and economic geologist, Dr. Nikki Atsheed Bell, president of Cupel Advisory Corp, and Ralph Rushton, president of Aftermath Silver. Welcome, lady and gentlemen, to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that, right. lady. <laughs> I, 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 I apologize, Nikki, if I still butchered your name. I tried my best. But, oh, uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. Well done. <laughs> we, have a, we have a very fun discussion today. This, started, this idea started when Brent and I spoke not too long ago. I asked him for his insights on, on, uh, on the mining sector, and he closed the, re the discussion with an interesting story about visiting uh, the Congo and some other jurisdictions around the world that are more unsafe than let's say Utah, where he's based. So, uh, so, so we thought let's bring in a few more experts in the field, share some stories, talk about the industry, the health of the industry, but more importantly, talk about your experiences having worked in the field. Because a lot of retail investors who are interested in the sector would like to do exactly what you've done, which is visit these sites, but maybe they don't have the chance now because of COVID, where they haven't had the chance before. So, uh, I'll pass it all to Brent now to uh, introduce, Brent, you can introduce your colleagues and friends a little more closely and, uh, and uh, we can carry on with a, with a story from you. Uh, sure, glad to. I think, you know, one thing that exploration geologists uh, get to do that most people don't is we end up in some very unusual way out places in different countries than that. And so the idea came about talking to you and I got hold of a few people I know, uh, geologists, uh, that I've met various places around the world that I know I've had experiences too. Like, like Nikki, I think the first time we got together was that trip to uh, North Queensland looking at the uh, an IOCG project. I think that was the first time we hooked up. And, uh, and then Ralph, I think Ralph, it was, we were down in Central America, uh, Nicaragua viewing a project. 2004? Yeah, somewhere back then. Yes, somewhere yeah. back then. Um, and then we, we shared, shared a few whiskeys since then. <laughs> yeah, we went through a lot of beer that week. <laughs> um, it was hot. And then, and Joe, I, I actually met Joe in, on a project in uh, Nevada uh, twice, uh, two different trips, and was so impressed with Joe's uh, no BS sort of attitude and straightforward thinking that. Uh, uh, I convinced him that writing a newsletter was probably the best thing for him to do to stay out of trouble. So that's I'm what we're regretting it. I'm still regretting it. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so that's kind of how this came about and who, how I know these folks. Uh, I guess, I suppose, with the exception of myself, you all must have some sort of bear story. I didn't get to work in Canada being an American, but Nikki might have a bear story, I think. Well, I, I kind of have a bear story. Um, I feel like that the bear story is slightly boring. Uh, when I first came to Canada, I, I did one week of field work, but I had enough incidences that occurred during that week of field work. Everybody thought I'd been out there for six months. And my bear story, uh, when I was told I was going out into the bush, uh, there was everyone was very blasé about bears, and I asked for an AK-47, to protect myself, I was told no. In fact, I was told I was not allowed to have a gun. All I had was bear spray, which means a bear has to be very, very close to you for it to actually work. And so I was out doing a long traverse one day and I came across very, very fresh bear paw prints. And I was on my own. I was in a dead zone. I couldn't use a radio. It was in northern Canada in the barren lands. It was grizzly country. So I wasn't brave. Uh, there was, <laughs> I, st I stood there and basically wanted my mum for a good 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> and then um, very carefully looked around me and couldn't see anything and then continued my traverse and I got up to the top of the ridge and there was this, the, it was very windy and, and the, the wind kept chopping and changing direction and I heard this woofing sound and apparently that's the sound a bear makes when it's really agitated. So I came very close that day, um, but survived to tell the tale. And I basically decided that Canadian geologists are way tougher than Australian. All we have to deal with are snakes. And I'd rather fight a snake than a bear 
any day of the week. Um, but I suppose uh, one of my most interesting site visits uh, and probably one of my most enjoyable ones was when I went to Liberia. And so for those that don't know, Liberia is in West Africa. It's a very poor country. And it was hit really hard by Ebola a number of years ago. And so I went to Liberia actually just, be, they hadn't officially declared it Ebola free and Ebola, we're in a pandemic at the moment, but the Ebola pandemic in that part of the world wasn't great. It's 90% mortality rate, but nonetheless, I decided to go visit a gold development project. And when I got picked up by the country manager, they were just stunned that someone was willing to come and visit them. And so I got treated like royalty and we were having a conversation that night over a beer about our bucket list. And I said, well, on my bucket list is to drive a haul truck. And he said, oh, I think we can make that happen. <laughs> and so uh, the next day we went to the mine and they were doing lots of tree, stri tree stripping. I had 10 minutes on a simulator and then I drove a haul truck for an hour uh, and uh, drove it. It was I, in action. I, it, was, it was in action, probably not the safest thing. And then after that, they asked me if I wanted to drive a, a digger. <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until I almost wiped out the cab, the cab of a haul truck that they said maybe I should stop that. So and then about 12 months later, the company went bankrupt. And so you know, maybe there is some cause and effect about having someone on site allowing them to drive big pieces of equipment that they haven't, they've never driven before. But suffice to say, it was a pretty amazing experience. Um, one of my best. Joe, you look like you have something to say. You look like you were ready to respond. You were deep in thought. Everybody else was just nodding along, and you were just you, you had. Uh, no, I, I like the uh, I like the bear story. I must say, um, I mean, uh, like Nikki says, that everybody's got a bear story. It didn't take long for Nikki to being out in the field to get a bear story. Uh, I hadn't worked in actually, even though I'm Canadian, I haven't worked much in Canada. Uh, most of my work's been in Australia and South America in terms of being in the field. But in the, uh, in the two field seasons I had up in the Arctic, you know, same sort of conditions, fly camp like uh, Nikki probably uh, in the Arctic, um, where we basically get dropped off. We build a little place for ourselves and then we go out. And after a while, when, they, uh, when you actually have a drill rig or something happening or geophysics, you, uh, if you get a geophysicist, you get a cook. Otherwise, you got to cook for yourself. <laughs> and then uh, basically dirt floors originally. And then uh, as the camp builds out, they bring you lumber and you build your own floors. And then you actually have a little bit of a camp. And then maybe they'll add showers. Uh, there was this one guy, basically, um, who was a geologist, a very good geologist, who ran the camp that's now back river with Sabina before. And uh, he wanted to be a prospector. And that's all he wanted to be. So they hired him to be a prospector and we were in, I think two or three tents and we finally built a shower, like a warm shower. And uh, we, uh, we put it in there and every, you know, three or four weeks, we'd take a shower. No, no, <laughs> we take one every, you know, every other three or four days. Uh, but this guy for four months, he never took a shower. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh my God, you go into that <laughs> kitchen tent, you couldn't smell anything but him. <laughs> and so, so after a while, we just basically took him, his chair and everything that he had and took him to the end of the dock and threw him in the water. Um, yeah, that, yeah uh, that, that was one story. Uh, Joe, well, at least your tents had floors. The one that we were staying in, in the Northwest Territories, we had no floor. It was the weirdest thing. I've never seen a tent without a floor. Yeah, well, we, you start with dirt floors until, you know, you, you get a geophysicist. And then when you get the drillers, then then they bring you lumber and you can build your floors. Uh, and, and if you're lucky, really lucky, you get a chopper. Canadians don't like having floors on their tents. Well, is this, initially, is this where this comes from? Well, I mean, initially, you just take that tent and keep going. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you can't have a floor. Crazy. Yeah, anyway. I don't have a bear story. I've got a baboon story. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I worked in South Africa for a few years and we were, myself and a couple of other geologists were in, I think it's the, the Pilansburg in the, in the middle of the Bushveld complex. And we were, we were, we were hiking up a, hiking up a little dry, dry riverbed and came around a bend and there was a, there was a large troop, I guess that is, is the word, a large troop of baboons crossing the path in front of us. Um, not too, like 50, 60 yards ahead of us. And the, the males were guarding 
where the families were crossing. So the, the families, the, the females and the whatever they call the, the little baboons were, uh, were crossing the path. And the moment the males saw us, they came towards us about 10 yards and sat down and all bared their canine teeth. And it was really obvious what they were saying. If we came any closer, they were gonna they were gonna come rip our faces off, basically. Um, yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, never never go near an angry baboon. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I guess a theme for me over the years in exploration has always been, you know, you got to be prepared for anything. Um, and I was doing some work in northern Iran on a, on a drill program out there, running running a project with a with a Turkish geologist who now who now works for I think El Dorado in Turkey. And he came to me one day, we were staying in this little hotel. Um, and he came to me in a blind panic. Uh, we'd had a, a, a local government judge was, was in the hotel with us and he was a, he was a firm believer in the, uh, the, in, in the revolution there. And he'd been sent to try a couple of murderers in the little town we were in. And um, this, this friend of mine came to me one day and says, you gotta get me out of town. He says, the, the, the judge has become my friend. And, and they've been chatting every night. He says, he's just invited me to be guest of honor. And I said, at what? What, what are you guest of honor for? He says, they're gonna hang these two guys tomorrow. And he says, he wants me, he wants me to be guest of honor. And he said, it's, it's at the car park behind, behind the hotel. And behind the hotel was a crane, two cranes. And there was a whole bunch of chairs with two in the middle. And he was gonna to have to sit there with the judge and watch these two guys get strung up. So we, uh, we placed a couple of calls. Sorry, what, what, which which office, country was this in again? Sorry, Iran. Iran, yeah. Hmm. So they, uh, they, 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 we, we placed a couple of calls to the office, and they, um, they, they placed a couple of calls to the hotel and said, "Oh, he's got a family crisis, and we've got to get him back to Turkey because uh, you know his whatever his kid's ill." And uh, and he, he was able to pack his bag and, and disappear that that afternoon. And I went off into the field, didn't come back till the next day when it was all over, and the, the crane was still there and the chairs had gone. <laughs> so yeah this uh yeah you got to be prepared for anything and and, and be, be flexible in, in in your approach to the business and you also have to be strict you have to be street smart there's some yeah. of the stories i've heard of uh where things have gone wrong is someone who hasn't really traveled before and is naive and arrives in a country usually there's a taxi involved um yeah. a bit of robbing and some a taxi and then hopefully you end up your destination one guy knew he ended up at his destination minus 500 bucks and his leather jacket but alive <laughs> they were very polite robbers <laughs> <laughs> well the same the same guy was involved in a thing it, 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 we were doing a stream sediment survey in bulgaria and he um he was taking a, a truckload of a sample back to turkey he got stopped at the border by the turkish uh, turkish authorities and they said well you're, you're importing gold we, we're going to have to uh we have to, you know, seal up the truck, take it to a bonded warehouse and anchor it. So he um, he uh, he went with a customs guard. They they sat in the in the truck and he drove it to Ankara. And when he got to Ankara, he took the guy out and got him blind drunk um, to the point where the, the the guy passed out. And then, then my friend and his wife took the truck up to a lake where the, where there was a gravel beach and they spent the whole night emptying the sample bags putting them in new bags and then then filling them with, with useless gravel and he took it back the next day to the customs officer. The samples went into our our, our warehouse and the, the customs still have a whole bunch of bags of gravel that they think has got gold in. Brent, can you top uh, Ralph's story? Uh, you told me one last time we spoke about you being in the Congo, but uh, I think Ralph still wins so far. <laughs> no, I, I haven't been, had the privilege of attending a hanging yet. Um, <laughs> Okay. You know, speaking of, you know, ending up in unusual places, though, I was in, in working a job in Papua New Guinea and came in and you have to meet with the locals and sort of tell them what you're doing. And this is mostly done in pidgin English, which I wasn't very good at. But uh, we went through, we're going to come here, we're going to take some samples out of the stream and ask, you know, analyze them, that sort of thing. And the chief stands up and says, a company was here four or five years ago, they came, took samples, left, and never came back. And the uh, and he figured that they came and took all of their gold and left and nothing. So was, you had to explain how the whole thing worked and such. And, and that didn't work out um, too well. But eventually we got we got the permission to stay there and and the chief let us use his hut to sleep in. Problem was rats. Um, all night long, there were rats 
crawling on the rafters and to the point where I was, I, I was trying to sleep with a machete. All <laughs> long, I'd be jumping up <laughs> with a rat had just run over me. <laughs> then my partner who's on the, who was sleeping on the ground there, he jumps up and screams and there's a rat stuck to his, you know. <laughs> oh. Lucky it was just his finger though. It was just his finger, yeah. <laughs> it's a euphemism, Nikki. Yeah, that's right. It was his finger. <laughs> It was his thing. <laughs> well, you know, I, I did some work in PNG as well, but on one of the islands. It was a beautiful island, and as Brent says, everyone speaks pidgin but different forms. And what was hilarious about Misima was their their name for white person was Dim Dim. And so whenever you'd walk along the road back, if you were going to walk back from the mine site to the camp, be hello, Dim Dim, hello, Dim Dim. It was it was very amusing it was also a relatively easy place to work because the um the islanders are very relaxed about life when i was working there at least the tribe i was working with the pigeon for a white man was long pig <laughs> <laughs> i have a general question for 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 all of you being uh someone who is not a geologist myself i'm i'm curious as to the incentive behind exploring in Far away and exotic places. Why? Why not just stay in North America, where where there's less risk of danger, so to speak? Well, you wouldn't get many interesting stories, but you know, from a geology <laughs> and mining and exploration perspective, uh, what what's uh, what's the uh, what's the incentive for going to Iran or Congo or you know? I've explored mineral belts, basically. Um, the, the the central volcanic belt that runs through Iran in this particular instance is probably like Chile was 30 years ago. Very, very low level of exploration, targets everywhere. Um, it's it's amazing geology. Um, you know, we found a we found a Carlin type system there with three or four million ounces of gold, but the issue is you can't develop it because you can't get a deal with the government. And the same and same with the DRC. And DRC is an amazing country. Almost any commodity that you can think of, the DRC is a world-class deposit. So and tough jurisdiction, very, very tough, but that's why. People keep going back to it. You have to go back to where, where there's the most highly perspective. And you mentioned North America. And so, yes, a country like America is, is, is more politically stable, but it's incredibly tough to get things permitted. Um, you're looking at years, even to get a drill program, for example. So sometimes it's much easier to, to move through the value chain in other countries as well. Okay. Do you, do you feel like the mining sector in North America is a little bit too saturated right now? Do you think deposits are more or less all discovered or is, are there still opportunities, you think? I think the easy stuff's been discovered. The sticking out of the ground, high, I'm here, yeah. stuff has been discovered. Uh, and what we're seeing is everywhere we're going deeper using, uh, there's been advances in, in earth penetrating geophysical techniques, et cetera, to allow us to do that. But uh, exploration is getting harder and harder, and I would say that's probably a global phenomenon. Or you go, or you're going back to old mines and, and ex exploring around previous producers and hoping that you're going to find something that may be lower grade uh, than they would have mined in the past. But, I mean, you can still find you can still find like I went to visit a project in in BC where they were still finding outcropping veins just because people never walk there, mm. and you see that a lot. In, uh, in Chile and uh, Argentina and a lot of places where people just don't get out of their trucks uh, and walk the, walk the ground, you can still find outcropping mineralization. But like Nikki said, especially in Australia, I mean, when I started working there in the mid nineties, uh, we were already going undercover, which is something people are just starting to do probably in, uh, in, uh, in North America. Like Newcrest, they start you know, getting excited when they're below 250, 300 meters below surface. So, uh, yeah, uh, the way you do exploration is a bit different. But uh, like back in the mid 90s, when I first got to Argentina, the idea that it was underexplored versus Chile. I mean, it's probably a lot less perspective. But, yeah, we spent a lot of money and time uh, exploring there back in the 90s. I think you touched the point with, us, with Australia, though, Joe. I mean, you know, the Australian style of mining has always been a little bit you know, more flexible. They, they've been willing to take five, six year mine lives, get an open pit through it and, and take out what they can and move on to the next one. That, that's been a, a typical Australian style of mining as well, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I worked, I worked at, uh, at, a, at a gold mine in Mount Isa and it's typical that they have a, uh, it was a small one for MIM, which is a base metal company, uh, but it, it was very high grade. 
Uh, it was very small open pit, went underground, and then they mined it out, and off they went. Uh, there, For me personally, uh, there's a, a much bigger propensity of management in Australia to take something into production there than with the North American crowd, you know, in my, in my experience. We just get in there and get it done. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Exactly. I mean, and there's, there's there's a lot less BS with respect to you know finding out if the metallurgy works, you know what the strip ratio is going to be, what the because they actually want to generate some money from it as opposed to saying how do we dress this up. Yeah, I would say the Australian way does tend to, and that's why you see things like Gualia Deeps, which in Canada they would have put a shaft in pretty early on in the piece, and in Australian the Australian approach was you always just had enough reserves ahead of you to justify short-term capex. And so um, there's, you know, there's pros and cons to, I think, both approaches, but definitely the Canadian approach is spending a lot more time drilling. There's much longer lead times in general between discovery and production. Um, yeah. but, but also WA is one of the easiest places in the world to permit in terms of timelines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which helps. But, but it's also worth going back into, into belts, you know, where there's – Parts of Africa, for example, some of the major companies out of South Africa were exploring there for years and years and years, but they were, it was fairly probably dogmatic exploration where they had a fixed idea of what they were going for. Um, yeah. and, and companies have come along the last 10, 15 years, you know, Robert Friedland's uh, group, for example, and have ch ch changed the thinking and have come in and made world class discoveries in belts that have been picked over for donkey's years. You know, stuff's still yeah. there. Yeah, well, well, I mean, if you look, sorry, if you look no, at right. Chalice, Chalice with uh, with what they found uh, that nickel you know mm. belt that they defined in Western Australia, the the regional geology map was wrong, and when they looked at the mag, they reinterpreted the mag and drilled and found nickel sulfide. So, and that's in Western Australia that you know seen a lot of exploration as well, and they were going deep cover a long time ago. So, there there I've seen a lot more stories recently of of people. Uh, potentially with COVID being forced to stay locally and doing a lot better work because they can't go anywhere else. Mm. I, mean, I think you hit the nail on the head there, doing a lot better work. I think particularly in the junior game, because you're awarded for the drill bit, there's a propensity to rush into drilling. And if you don't hit something, there's an automatic assumption, well, nothing must be there, move on to the next thing. And so rather than doing, as Joe said, back when we were both, young geos in the 1990s in Australia, the larger companies were investing in five plus five year exploration programs and doing terrain scale exploration from the bottoms up. And so really, really, really good science and good geology. And I think we're still benefiting from that today. And so the problem with the junior market is we, we commonly sk are skipping a couple of steps and those steps which are boring, the market doesn't <coughs> respond to, which is geophysics and and mapping and soils, it's a very, very important part of the geology puzzle. Nikki, I'm curious to learn a little more about DRC. I know journalists like to talk about the DRC, and in particular, the, the conflict of minerals um, situation surrounding that region. What exactly are they referring to? Can you, can you shed some light? Uh, they're talking about, well, it'll be the illegal miners and the use of child labor. So it's a really complex one. The whole idea of of passing judgment on illegal miners. If, I mean, if you were in the DRC and you're an, um, a Congolese native and you had nothing else and you wanted to feed your kids and you wanted your kids to survive to adulthood you'd, and all you had was artisanal mining, um, people will put themselves through the most horrific, and I've seen the same in Burkina Faso, incredibly dangerous, horrific conditions to make a living. And so, uh, and of course, when you have high value commodity such as diamonds, like you do in the DRC as well, then you can tend, tend to get, um, it can help fund rebel groups. And so you have this whole complex situation in the DRC, um, which is going to be very, very difficult to resolve. It's a massive country. There's very little infrastructure. You have a bunch of different uh, tribal groups that are not necessarily aligned. It's tribe first versus country first a lot of corruption, but a huge amount of mineral prospectivity. And so all of those things create this melting pot that's pretty challenging. I, I remember when I was still in the university, I've spoken to some activist groups who 
we're lobbying against, uh, we're lobbying for the hedge funds where some of the funds that uh, have have invested in mining companies to stop investing in mining companies working in those jurisdictions. I mean, is that is that a fair thing to do? How would you respond no. to No. I think it's really easy if you're from a wealthy society or from the West, again, to sit and pass judgment. I mean, you can afford to have an environmental conscience, for example, when you have excess wealth. And for all of us that have traveled around the world, um, and this is where mining has done itself as disservice, it hasn't, I think, demonstrated all the positive things that occur. You, you, you go into a country and that has had no investment, no education in certain areas that are remote. And when a mine comes in, the amount of wealth that's generated for the local population, and it's not just wealth, it's healthcare, it's, it's children surviving to adulthood, it's reduction in malaria. Uh, I remember going to see Equinox when it was Lamwana in Zambia when it was still a development project. And every day there was a hundred people lined out outside the mine looking for a job. And it wasn't yet a mine. It was kind of, it, when you go to Africa, you see true poverty. It's um, and people aren't getting enough food. If there's not a rainy season, it's, it's, I think, so I think it's, you have to be very cautious about passing judgment on how another country acts and behaves, and particularly when it's one that's trying to start to generate its own wealth. Well, yes, that's a really good point. I mean, my, my experience working in the Middle East, Iran, Pakistan, Pakistan in particular, is that the level of poverty and, and, and the um, so many people are living hand to mouth. It's, it's a very subsistence way of, of, of living. You know, if your goat dies, you starve. Um, and there was always, uh, as, as you say, there was always, whenever we drove into a village, there were people looking for work, coming up in the evening saying, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you going to build a mine? Can, can, can we come and work for you? Uh, it's been a common theme in my career in many, many countries. Yeah. Well, you see this happening right now with, uh, with the Navidad project in, uh, in Chubut, which is basically in the middle of a desert, uh, you know, and I used to live down there. And you have the people in the Andes in the tourist place where I used to live in a scale against it. And the people on the coast that have money against the project, but the people that are right there want the project because there's, there, there are no jobs. There's nothing going on there. And, and uh, you know, these people who want the job, want the mind to go ahead are being uh, like influenced by these people that don't want it, but have nothing to do with the local economy there. And uh, you see that in a lot of places where, uh, you know, the locals want the project, but people from outside don't want the project. But as Nikki said, the project in itself would bring a billion dollars of foreign direct investment potentially into the into the area and generate a lot of jobs through construction and operations, which, you know, the coast or the uh, or the Andean region would not be able to fund right Who now. Who usually pays for the infrastructure? Is it the local government or the mining companies? Mining no, the mining companies. companies usually usually pay. I mean, uh, the thing is that you have to build, if you have to build, you know, improve roads and that, mm -hmm. you can get help from the uh, the government. But usually what they try to do is give you tax incentives. So if you build things that they will use, uh, you can basically, you don't have to pay taxes on that. And what they're trying to do is reduce the amount of taxes during the payback period such that they can get a better return on their invested capital, which might be up to a billion dollars. But to build the plant, you know, to pre-strip, if that's what you're going to do, underground development, all that is on you. That's yeah. all the money you got to spend. But the issue is that you're employing these people potentially, uh, and and then they get the direct benefits from taxation, uh, from, you know, higher paying jobs, uh, you know, better lifestyles and all that other stuff that, you know, the knock-on impact, you know, the, the multiplier impact of, of, of a mine. What, one area where I saw a startling example of this, I was running an Australian listed company with a big open pit gold mine in northeastern Brazil in a very poor part of Brazil. And the mine was the biggest economic contributor to the state of Amapá, employed 1,200, we had 1,200 employees and, and, and contractors. And something as simple as one of the women from one of the local villages, she worked in the cafeteria. And because she worked at the mine, she now had private health care. She earned enough to send her kid her daughter to school and sent her daughter to university and so even some of the what would be considered the lower paid less skilled jobs um, they'll have a fundamental impact on somebody's life and their ability for their children to jump a social sphere and 
and that's that's the amazing thing. And it's also when when someone has a job, they they desperately want to keep keep it. So there's also there's this you have to make sure that employees are, are treated well. They can be because of the desire to have a job and all the positive things that can come along with that. But yeah, the most the most extreme example I've seen of that that desire for the income or, or maintaining the income was in South Africa when I when I worked there in the in the eighties underground. When a when a, a migrant worker was coming to the end of his you know contract, some of them were were looking to retirement, and they would actually deliberately injure themselves um, to to get basically retirement benefit or injury benefit from the company. Um, typically, it would be a, a left hand. They'd put their hand in a piece of machinery just to, uh, and and you know they could they could go back to to parts of Tanzania or Malawi or wherever it is they were from and, and actually have a have a good income, a very good income for, for, for those villages. It was, it was a very strange thing to, to hear about, but it wasn't, it wasn't uncommon. Let's start, with, let's start with Brent. Brent, maybe you can tell us about some of the highest developing or growth potential areas in the world right now in terms of uh, mining exploration jurisdictions. And then we can maybe talk about specific companies. Oh, wow. I mean, it, it really comes down to geological prospectivity. Uh, the Andes are still probably one of the best places to be exploring. Uh, the Tethian belt runs from Romania through Turkey all the way into China. Uh, that's well underexplored, but tougher to get into. Western US, Canada, uh, there, there's lots of good places to explore. It's, it's, each one comes with its own uh, headaches and, and assets as well. It's, you know, permitting timelines, uh, politics, Ecuador's probably going the wrong direction, Zambia's going the right, wrong direction. Uh, Australia is going the right direction. Uh, it, it, it really varies as to where the best place is to be. It comes down to, I think, risk to reward. Uh, the tougher the area, the bigger the prize. Well, why is that? Well, you just said the tougher the area, the bigger the prize. It goes back to what Nikki was talking about. And that, you know, the developed countries, Australia, uh, almost everything being found there is being found undercover. So it's much more uh, time consuming and expensive to, uh, to test for uh, mineralization. For instance, if you can find a one gram deposit at surface in Nevada or Australia, that's economic probably, but it's, you're not gonna find that. So what you end up doing is you're drilling for, you need a two and a half gram deposit at a depth to make money at, but it's gonna take the same amount of money to disprove that uh, as only being a one gram deposit versus a two and a half gram deposit. So you push, you piss away a lot of money drilling things that if it was close to the surface, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to. For, for instance, I think, you know, on, on average for every two and a half gram gold deposit, there's probably 10 one gram deposits. So your odds of finding a two and a half gram one are pretty low. I, I would just add, I would just add that you know nobody would go to the DRC for a one gram deposit. Yeah. Because what you need when you take on that risk of working in some jurisdiction is you want payback. So if you're going into the DRC or you know a lot of parts of West Africa and Africa as a whole, um, you know you, you need a quick payback for people to actually give you the money to build the project. You could build a longer payback project in Nevada or Ontario or Western Australia, where it might be a 15 year mine life, but have a four year payback. You're not gonna do that in, uh, in the DRC. Uh, you're gonna look for um, you know, uh, an incremental capital project where you can get the payback. And like, like Newmont with the Anacocha, when they first went in and they found it, uh, those exploration geologists weren't supposed to be there. <laughs> uh, they weren't supposed to find that deposit and they did it all on the sly and then they found it. And when they found it, they didn't want to take the risk of owning 100% of it, hence the deal with Buenaventura. If that deposit was in Nevada, there's no way they would give that project up to another company. Or no way they find it. Yeah. yeah. So are the costs of exploration actually lower or higher in emerging economies? It depends. Well, it depends. It depends because, I mean, I the local labor... In Ecuador, we were paying, well, not me, but the, the company was paying this kid five bucks an hour, uh, five bucks a day, sorry. Uh, so, I mean, in, hence the in, reason. My, my experience in Iran was that the company I was working for at the time spent close to $3 million on legal fees. The cost of operating in the country was incredibly cheap. It was, you know, one cent a litre for gas. 
So once you actually started exploring, it was cheap, but the setup and the legals and the negotiation, it, it almost made it prohibitive. But, yeah. but Brent, Brent touched on an interesting point that I think it's, it's, it's worth you know, reiterating for any, anybody with a passing interest in exploration is that most of what we do in our careers is we disprove stuff. Mm. We drill holes and we don't find anything. Um, you know, and it's a lucky geologist that's involved in a world-class world class discovery. And most of what we do is not finding things. We go into Turkey, Iran, wherever, and you don't find anything. You look, but you don't find it. So what's the next step? If you don't find anything, what, what what's the response from the company or from investors? Well, if major companies, they'll cut your budget. They'll, they'll disband the team, you know, and then they'll wait for the next commodity cycle and realize they're two, three years behind behind the crowd and suddenly suddenly build a team and, and try and get back exploring. Juniors are a little bit more flexible. Um, I, think yeah. it, I think it makes more sense. If you're not going to find anything, do that in Italy rather than Liberia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean, I actually think the decision of when to walk away maybe doesn't happen often enough. And the problem is if you're a single asset junior company, you're forced to keep spending yeah. time and money on that. If that's all you have, you can't really say to the market, mm, it's not very good. So sometimes I think too much money is wasted. And Never thought of another good project, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, but that's exactly what Nikki said is what they have to do. They have to promote that asset. And so it's a signal when they actually go and buy another yeah. asset. You know, when they're sort of saying, okay, this is the best project in the world. And then suddenly, oh, we got, we just bought this one. And, uh, you know, because now they want to diversify. But in a big company, your whole idea is to spend as much money as you can as quickly as possible. And like Ralph said, kill it and move on to the next one because you don't want to be spending money, you know, uh, and just, uh, yeah, cause you got you got to answer, you, you answer to the executive committee every year and say, well, what, what have you guys yeah. spent $87 million on? What have you got to show for it? Yeah. But, but saying that the promotional ability is not just among the junior CEO, it's also internally exactly. in the exploration teams yeah. of the major companies, those guys in there that promote their own budgets, you know, and can, push a project forward to the ill or good of the company, those are the guys that actually get the big budgets, you know? And, and unfortunately some guy who blows a billion dollars usually has a job and the guy who doesn't blow the billion dollars usually doesn't get the job. It's very, very true. Well, I mean, the sad thing is, is the minute there's a slight downturn, the first area that gets cut is the R and D and it's the exploration geologist. And we see this time, I mean, in, since I've been in Canada, I've seen at least four cycles where exploration geologists have been cut. Uh, we saw it in 2008, 2009, and then two years later, everyone's desperately trying to hire them back. And so this lack of commitment to taking a long-term view uh, on exploration, it hurts us, it hurts the industry. Ironically, it's good for, for commodity prices because you need to have price incentivization to encourage exploration and everybody wants a quick win and that's almost that almost never happens but unfortunately I think, I, I think that what you're describing there nikki has a there's another impact which is on the on the uh people that are, are not coming into the business anymore yeah you know, you, you, I'm, I'm hearing of university departments across canada that have no enrollments um no. Particularly, particularly petroleum geology you know there's the the, the downturn has been so severe um, people just don't want to do it as a career anymore. All right. Let's, uh, we've all talked about uh, jurisdictions now. Let's just wrap up the conversation with your outlook on commodity prices. Joe brought that up uh, just now. Why don't, why don't we start with, uh, with you, Joe? Your outlook on, um, well, base metals as well as precious metals, just given, just given the activity you've seen on the ground. Well, um, in terms of the gold market, I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm probably less optimistic just because of uh, you know the erosion of demand you know from you know cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and that. But I'm uh, what I'm encouraged about is that there's not a lot of good assets out there, and so those assets that are appealing uh, should get higher value, and it's a bit of the scarcity issue. So I'm I'm still in the gold market, but I'm definitely looking for quality as you should. The silver has, you know, like we were talking about the squeeze and all that, and um, but it's it's even harder to find a decent silver asset that's actually a silver asset, not a silver equivalent mm -hmm. asset. So if you can find something good in silver, uh, that's something that'd be rare and that would be worth something. You know, that's probably why Silvercrest gets the valuation it does and Mag Silver as well. And then in terms of base metals, you know, uh, a push we made about two or three years ago was, you know, for this 
greenhouse gas emission reduction, carbon neutral sort of future. And, you know, we're in copper, nickel, uh, and palladium, as well as other metals looking for assets that fit that bill. All right, Nikki? Yeah, I would absolutely concur with Joe on the, uh, the metals, the green metals. That's here to stay. So uh, copper and nickel and and to your point, Joe, it's very hard to find really decent copper assets. Uh, paucity, paucity of silver assets, yes, but copper, it's, in, it's, it's also very difficult. On the gold side, I'm positive on gold. Um, maybe that's because I'm somewhat biased and have spent most of my career focused on gold plus a bit on the, on the base metal side. Um, I think that you have to pick and choose. I think that uh, world-class assets in any commodity – um, you can own them and that will hold their value over the long term. And in this cycle, we've, we've just seen a lot of frothiness in the market. And I think a lot of companies that are probably overvalued um, based on kind of what we know about their asset base versus some others. Um, but a lot of the producers, they're making a lot of money. They've had capital discipline. They'll probably keep that in place for at least another year or so. They're paying dividends. They're starting to put money in the ground. So, yeah, I'm still pretty positive on the gold side. Okay. Uh, Ralph, I'm going to guess you like silver. Just wild guess out there. Uh, I, I have, I have, I, I'm, I'm curious to know your thoughts on the gold silver ratio and where it should be. I've heard, I've heard estimates from miners that uh, theoretically the gold silver ratio should be around nine to one because that's a natural ratio coming out of the ground. Um, I don't know if you agree with that statement. I, I, I would have to defer. I think there's, there's, there's a ton of analysts out there who know way more about these things than I do. I'm a, I, you know, I'm a geologist. I, I, I would maybe take a step back and say, I think what we look for as mining companies or, or what we hope for is either stability in prices um, or an increase in prices. Volatility is what really hurts us because then you can't predict your revenue when you're mining. And, and as, a, as a, a junior company CEO, it's very tough to predict when you can raise more capital to get out and do the exploration. So that that's I, I think that's what I'd say. I, I don't really want to sort of get into discussing or trying to discuss the silver price because it's not something, you know, there's a thousand analysts cleverer than I am uh, and they all get it wrong. Um, so, so that's, that's what I would say. We, we, we would like to see stability uh, in the long-term equilibrium price. We would like to see it in increasing. We don't want to see extreme volatility. And that's one of the problems at the moment with the immediacy of information out there online is that vol volatility. Um, it's, it's really tough to, 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 to see what's going to be happening six months from now, particularly with, with, with stock prices. Um, my own portfolio, I mean, I invest heavily in the company that I, that I work for, um, but I've been looking at recovery stocks. So I've been buying the diversified producers, uh, the techs, the anglers, that kind of stuff. And, and, and they've, all, they've all done pretty well. It's been slow and gradual, but solid increases. Brent, why don't you uh, close out the conversation for us? Do you think there's going to be more or less volatility just following up on... Uh what Ralph said in the space? Uh, both. I, but I think, jumping to the other question, um, I think the overriding thing over the next decade or so is going to be legitimate economic discoveries. And I want to emphasize legitimate economic there. Yeah, I, I, um, I, know, I know you like to point out scammers on, on Twitter. So I think viewers really appreciate that. <laughs> one of my favorite things to do. But that's the overriding thing. And I think, I think you know, Personally, uh, Joe and I, that's, that's kind of our exit strategy is to have something legitimately discovered and bought out by a, a major mining company. Uh, my personal focus is going to be on gold to lesser sex stiller, silver, uh, nickel and copper. I think that's the place to be. And I'm just, you know, it's there's a dearth of discoveries. There's a dearth of new reserves coming into the market for production. And that's the place to be. Okay. Well, this was a very interesting discussion. I personally learned a lot. Um, it, there's no better way to get information than from the people who's actually worked on the ground. Analyst reports don't have that first primary source information like, uh, like you do. So thank you very much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. Great. thank you. All the best to you. I hope to speak with all of you again soon. And thank you for watching. I'm David Lynn.